Hello, I'm Clary Jackson. This video is a continuance of my demonstration that the standard for proof in the Canadian criminal justice system has eroded to a bar so low it has removed crucial safeguards for the innocent accused. These safeguard removals have been done in exchange for furthering the rights of alleged victims of crime, enabling them to fraudulently use the criminal justice system as a blunt force weapon against a person they have animosity towards for any given reason other than actually being sexually assaulted by them. My last video talked about the removal of the corroboration requirement. You can watch that first, or after this one. The order doesn't matter in terms of background context. That video, in conjunction with this video, should make the precarious state of our criminal justice system clear. And I need to emphasize, this is not just the Canadian justice system. These safeguards have been removed in most, if not all, Western criminal justice systems. All right, let's get to the statute of limitations in sex crimes. But first, I'd like to ask you to consider donating to help me continue producing content. I have a very small donor base, as it is, and as much as I appreciate that, a donor base that contributes monthly toward development of a publicly accessible library of data and condensed information would greatly incentivize me to continue toward a path of meaningful action in restoring safeguards for the innocent accused, using that library as a foundation. Lastly, if you wish to personally or professionally contribute in other ways towards my efforts or team up, I am open to suggestions. Okay, a statute of limitations in the legal system represents a time limit for different things depending on the context. In the criminal justice system context, it can mean the amount of time between a crime occurring and that crime being reported to the police a marker of which a case may be known as a historical allegation, historical sexual abuse, for example. It can also mean the amount of time between a person being investigated by police and charges actually being laid for the alleged crime or the window of time between being charged and being brought to prosecution, a marker for which charges may be dropped due to an unconstitutional amount of time an accused person was kept waiting for their trial while in jail, for example. In the context of civil law, a statute of limitations represents the window of time between the cause of the alleged damages for which the plaintiff is seeking to be financially compensated and the time of filing the lawsuit. In this video, I'm focusing on the criminal justice context, sex crimes, and the window of time between an alleged historical sex crime and reporting it to the police. A statute of limitations in the context of a historical allegation is not to be confused with a cold case. A cold case is best described as an unsolved case where there is no doubt a crime occurred. You have a dead body, for example, but a perpetrator cannot be affirmatively identified. An example of why the legal system would impose a statute of limitations is to prevent people from reporting an allegation where there is a high probability that investigating it would waste resources, bear fruitless results, and possibly be abetting a fraudulent claim. For example, you report to police today that your home was robbed of all your precious family heirlooms 30 years ago, but you no longer live in that house. It's been renovated or it burnt down. This is very different than reporting 30 years ago that your home was robbed that day, but that as of today, the police were never able to match a possible robber to the evidence during their investigation 30 years ago. That would be a cold case. The former scenario would be a highly suspicious one in terms of the motive behind making such a report 30 years later. Now let's take that one step further and say the victim claiming they were robbed 30 years ago has named a perpetrator. This technically solves the identification issue. It gives the police a name and a person to investigate. However, that named perp will be put in a position where they would have to prove they did not rob that house 30 years ago. Most importantly, there is no fresh crime scene evidence to investigate at this point. 30 years later. 
If the report was made 30 years ago, the, d the day that it happened, the police will have preserved evidence such as photographs, fingerprints, DNA, break-in tools, etc. to match up with a possible perpetrator. But in this case, the victim is only coming forward with their claim 30 years after the fact, seemingly trying to pinpoint a crime that cannot be proven to have occurred on a likely innocent person. There is no opportunity to preserve fresh crime scene photographs, fingerprints, DNA, break-in tools, etc. What do you think the police are mo most likely going to do? If you're thinking that they will tell the person to go away because they can't open a case under these circumstances, you are right. That is the most likely scenario and the one we as reasonable people would expect. One of the fundamental principles of law and a tenant of our constitution is that a person accused of a crime has equal rights under the law and has the right to make full answer and defense to the allegations against them. That is the foundation for imposing a statute of limitations on reporting crimes to police. You would probably agree that in my family heirlooms robbery scenario, it would be inconceivable to deprive an accused perpetrator of constitutional protections if the police were to pursue an investigation against them 30 years after the fact without being able to collect any crime scene evidence, the crime scene not even being in existence or having been altered or contaminated by other people living in that house. The accused person would be deprived of equal rights under the law while they were deprived of making full answer and defense to those allegations for which there is no proof a crime occurred, other than a person going to the police out of the blue, claiming they were robbed 30 years prior. The accused person would have no meaningful way to provide proof that they were not at that alleged scene of the crime 30 years ago. There will be no physical records in existence that can either put him at or remove him from the alleged scene of the crime. In order to preserve that accused person's equal rights under the law and the right to make full answer in defense, he cannot be reasonably and fairly charged nor prosecuted in that scenario. For the bad news, Canada, along with many other jurisdictions across the Western common law regimes, has removed the long-standing imposition of a statute of limitations on sex crimes in recent decades. For the last 30 plus years, Canada's criminal justice system has been arresting, charging, prosecuting, and convicting people for sex crimes alleged to have occurred years and decades prior to reporting them to the police. So these cases are constructed with no proof of crime, no crime scene evidence, no physical injury evidence, no corroboration as per my previous video, and no supporting evidence at all that the crime undoubtedly occurred and that the identified perpetrator can be proven to have been at the scene of the crime when it allegedly occurred. To show you proof that these cases exist, Here's a look at a publicly available database for crimes reported to police in the Toronto, Ontario area, the Metro Toronto area. I'll leave a link to it in the description bar below. And when it's filtered for sex crimes or sexual violence, at the time I recorded this, sometime before the new year, there were over 2,000 police reports made in the year 2019. About a quarter of them are historical. The earliest one is, uh, I think it's 1965. I'm not looking at it right now, but you're looking at it so you can see what the date is. It's either 1965 or 66. Unfortunately, this database does not number each record, so I can't tell you exactly how many. I can only surmise about a quarter. You can have a look yourself. It clearly states the date the crime was reported versus the date the alleged crime occurred. Statistics Canada does not record such historical allegations in a meaningful way. They all get lumped together according to the date reported. So, for example, there is no statistical distinction between the date reported and the date the alleged crime occurred. This creates misleading data in terms of current data for sex crimes against children in a current year, 
because a portion of them are adults who allege to have been historically abused as a child. So I hope by now you, my viewers, are beginning to understand the grave problem I am describing. This means that the probability of alleged victims getting away with fraud, aided and abetted by a faction of less than ethical police, prosecutors, and judiciary has been significantly increased by the removal of a statute of limitations on reporting sex crimes. It also means that many innocent accused people are left defenseless and betrayed by their own government, which pursues such cases against them. I'd like to acknowledge naysayers that disagree with me and believe that the removal of such a safeguard from the justice system is just in the name of helping sexually abused victims get justice. These are people that believe sexual abuse is the only crime that occurs without any witnesses and that their stories should be told and believed. These are people that believe alleged victims only wait for years or decades to come forward because of embarrassment, shame, or fear buried by drug or alcohol addictions. These are people that never acknowledge false accusations and wrongful convictions occur in such cases. These are people that believe that you need not prove a crime occurred in order to come to a judgment that it did. These are people that believe the burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt is too high and must continue to be demolished until all claims result in convictions. These are people that believe a story told with convincing and dramatic emotion, no matter how riddled with holes or inconsistencies, should be accepted as truth. These are people that believe self-described victims' rights to pursue such justice override an accused person's right to the protection of the Constitution from wrongful arrest and prosecution and to the right to a meaningful defense. These people are lawyers, police officers, government officials, politicians, women's rights advocates, psychotherapists, legal professors, public prosecutors, judges, etc. These are all people who all benefit from these cases in ways that provide motive and incentive to allow this injustice to be perpetrated against innocent law-abiding people. They are heartless, selfish, manipulative people who are just as fraudulent as the alleged victim going to a police officer claiming that they were robbed of their family heirlooms 30 years ago. In conclusion, question every case where you hear of a man or a woman being charged and prosecuted for an alleged historical sexual abuse case. Consider everything I've said in this video and ask yourself, can I stand for this injustice? Can I have confidence in a justice system that doesn't require reasonable proof that a crime has even occurred in the first place? Can I stand by and fund this injustice with my tax dollars? If you feel you can't, I suggest to you that you talk openly about this to your coworkers, peers, family members, and write to your local MP about your concerns on these cases each time you read about them in the news. Thank you for listening.